Hi everybody and welcome to the Helen Winder Show. I'm Helen Winder and my guest today is Hayden Shaughnessy. Hello Hayden, how are you? Hi Helen, very good, thanks. Great. Well, tell um, our listeners a little bit about yourself and, and what it is you do. Mm, yeah, I can, it's always difficult, isn't it, to know quite where to start with that question. <laughs> um, probably, I, I've, I've been a writer for about 25 years in different guises. So for some national newspapers as well as magazines and digital uh, websites, obviously. And, and actually, also at the same time, I've done a lot of work in quite a lot of detail on how industries change and how companies have to change when, when you get serious fragmentation of, of industries or disruption of industries. People like the word disruption these days. But if you go back about, about a year ago, um, I, I had an audience online of about a million readers a month. So I, uh, in this socially empowered world, set out to build an audience online and I did that. I actually found myself quite disenchanted or, or disappointed once, I, once I'd achieved that kind of target mm. because it seemed to me that most of what I was saying was pretty much what other people were saying. I might say it slightly differently, but, but I think that the online world is, is pretty full of, um, uh, well, it's perhaps an echo chamber, that might be the way to put it. Mm -hmm. So I decided to move away from that and, and start started to concentrate more on the analytical work that I did. And that analytical work is obviously to me utterly fascinating. If you look at how industries change, you can understand what enterprises, companies have to do to remain in the game. And a lot of them uh, are struggling to remain in the game. A lot of companies, even those that are reporting growth, are actually struggling at the moment. They're struggling mm. With their, with their cash flow and their finances and that type of thing. So, so my uh, second phase uh, of my writing career has been very much about focusing on those problems and trying to find a framework to understand it. And, and that led me to write a book called Shift. And Shift is the subtitle is a user's guide to the new economy. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is really. It, it's really looking at the different kind of roles that companies are playing and the different roles that we have to play in the economy. I, I actually think that the best part of the book, and I must say uh, as, a, as somebody that's, I'm the writer of the book and, I, and I'm going to talk positively about it, but, but actually when you write a book uh, at that level of detail, I think it's very hard not to be very critical of it as well. So yeah. I know the weaknesses of the book, I know where I didn't do enough research, I know where I was guessing and those types of things. But I've tried to do a really in-depth, honest look at, at what this new economy means for people like me and you, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and how how we have to behave differently, and kinds of things like you've done. You know, you look at this, you do your your program. Who on earth would have thought that folks like us would be doing this? Uh, yeah. Because that used to be with people on television. So That's very true, isn't it? We, it is, and, and, and now we all have this opportunity, uh, opportunity and responsibility as well, and sometimes the, the obligation is very difficult because, you know, you can be successful, but most people aren't. Most people are trying to string together a number of different ways of making money. So it might be some Airbnb rentals, it might be some Uber driving, it might be something on eBay, it might be a whole range of things that they're doing to put together an interview, for, uh, sorry, an interview, put together a, a revenue stream that, that, for example, gives them a chance of um, buying a place in London, yeah. a, a one-bedroom apartment or a studio apartment. So, so the point of the book is to say, look, there's some very, very exciting changes going on, and we tend to focus on the technology and the innovation requirement, but actually it means a whole lot for how we live our lives and how we plan our lives, and I've tried to combine those two elements in the book. But, that's a, it's a really great um, thing to have done because we 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 forget about all the other elements uh, apart from you know that, that that sort of fall alongside with the IT side of things. It, we have to shift. We have to change. We have to keep up with it all. But we also have to think about how it affects us not just IT wise and communication wise but but on other other levels yes yeah in fact I just got off from interviewing somebody in one of the major 
global companies. He was responsible for that company's innovation program. And he said, it's not about the technology. Really, opportunity now is, is in about understanding people's expectations. Yeah. And I thought it was very true. And as he, as he explained, uh, the implications of that, they happened to be in the, air, the, air, the airport um, or the air travel business. And he said, for example, at the moment, the, the whole process of getting through an airport is, is a nightmare. It's one of the worst user experiences that you can imagine. Mm. Um, but what it also does, it brings people into airports a lot earlier and means they hang around a lot longer and <laughs> you know, the experience gets worse. But the airports benefit from it and that's actually quite wrong. Um, so just on, on that level alone, there's, there's a huge change in how we experience one particular aspect of our lives. There's nothing to do with technology. And, and it's bad for us, but it's great for the airports. And those are the kind of things that, that actually government should be addressing. You know, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't allow a situation to arise where security issues become financially beneficial to airports and, and experientially difficult for us. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the book, actually, I have a section on government policy, and, and I think that might be interesting to people. I think it would be very interesting to people because we don't talk about it enough. We, again, with government policy, we, we hear about investment, for example, in fintech in London and things like that. Mm -hmm. But actually, what's, what governments need to do is to support individuals in constructing these quite complex revenue opportunities that they, they now have to build their lives from. If you, if you look like if you look at the tech industry, actually, one of the biggest drivers of change in the tech industry is the open source movement. And the open source movement is basically free labor. Yeah. And, and those folks in that movement are trying their best to build reputation, build a skills base and all the rest of it so they can get a job. Um, that area, open source um, software, actually now has a 40-year history. So being engaged in that community will take you places. It's, it is not a bad career move to be involved in that. But if you look around us, you know, look at something like social media, but also look in the broader economy, we're all being asked to behave in, in a similar way, which is, OK, you, your employment is pretty unguaranteed. Mm -hmm. You have to build reputation from doing work for free. And you have to take huge chances with how you create your portfolio of work interests. Yeah. Actually, none of us are trained, none of us are trained to do that, and and that's where I think government policy should start to support us better. Yes, um, definitely. It, 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 they seem to forget about the people side of things. Well, I think that governments are not really set up to do policy for individuals in in an economic sense. They're meant they're, they're designed to support large companies mm -hmm. and, and the whole of economic policy revolves around that but actually right now the whole of the economy revolves around around the individual and, yeah. and the choices that individuals are making so we need we need um, a big change in policy but it's very difficult to see where that's going to come from because governments don't understand it no no they don't absolutely is it it's I mean that's probably a completely different subject on its own but it it is crucial that that they they do understand that you know the, it's the people at the end of the day that will enable the the economy to to shift and to grow and and to keep going it, it's uh, that well that's my view anyway no, I think you're quite right I think it's absolutely the case but what governments tend to do is work from these uh, macroeconomic theories, uh, whether it's Keynesianism or, or monetarism, and they were good for the 1930s, they were good for the 1970s and 1980s, mm -hmm. but now we need to be working on policies and theories that really talk about these free-flowing ecosystems of people that work in social media or work in open source software or work in open design, things like that, and, and we need to be developing policies to support them. Yeah. So, it, it requires also an academic shift. It requires quite a lot of change to get there. But I don't think we've got a lot of time. And I think that these changes have to, made, have to be made very quickly, actually. It's just incredibly difficult to see where the incentive for government comes from. Yeah. It's also quite difficult for um, the, the thinking community, like the community of writers or economists or whatever it is, to change the structure of information, you know, because most of, most of these people get their, get their information from... Um, 
things like the Harvard Business Review or other entities like that, uh, you know, old-fashioned organizations that, that, that um, informed the last generation of business. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When, um, obviously, ha with your book, how will it help people? Why, why should somebody go along and purchase it? Because uh, I know I've, I've got my own copy. Okay, good. <laughs> um, I, I think that the, the, there are real issues with how we acquire information and where we go to to find the right information and have the right debate. And, and that's, I suppose that's quite a long-winded way of uh, saying anything. I should find a, a snappier way of saying it. But, but look, if you, if you read the daily papers, you're really working in what, in what you might call the consensus tunnel, mm -hmm. um, the, the, le the left-right consensus. And, and these are uh, discussions, polarizations of arguments that we've lived with for 80 years, 100 mm -hmm. years. Times have changed significantly. Yeah. And, and I think if you want to understand where the debate should be, mm -hmm. then you should read Schiff. Um, I, I don't say that Shift is going to be an easy read for you, though. It's not one of these books which is the seven ways to change your financial status or the seven ways to have longer holidays or whatever. Mm -hmm. Whatever these kind of formulaic books are, it's it's more detailed, it's it's much deeper, and I hope it's richer. But the basic premise of it, number one objective, if you like, is to is to inform a debate. Mm -hmm. The second objective, though, is to say, actually, uh, if you're a company leader, you actually need to rethink what a company means. Companies today and in future are not going to be the same entity that they are, that they have been, or that they are right now. And, mm -hmm. and that's visible when you look at companies that have these huge ecosystems and huge customer bases. And Apple has 800 million customers and 500,000 developers around. And the third thing is, what do you as an individual do about that? Mm -hmm. and, and the answer that I've tried to give for companies, uh, smaller companies, challenging companies and individuals is, you really need to take a very disciplined view of what your options are. So people, people tend to think about how they invest in something or how they develop something in a pretty linear way. You know, that I'm going to go to university and get this degree and get that type of job. Or if you're a company, I make this product, I'm going to do this, this, this piece of R&D to improve it or to create a new one, and then I'm going to sell it. But actually, right now, what you need to do is think in terms of optionality, what, what kind of options do I need to have prepared, ready to respond to whatever's going to change in my market or my, my range of opportunities. Yeah. And that's particularly the case for folks like us, you know, where you're doing this show right now, um, but are you prepared for the different options that it might bring, uh, or options that might conflict with other things that you're doing yeah. to make money at the moment? Yeah. So, so in, in both cases, in the case of the corporate uh, reader and the individual reader, I try to make the case for thinking more in terms of optionality and how you balance options in your life. That's really important, isn't it? We we have to know, we have to prepare ourselves so that yes, you you might want to go down one channel or one road. Um, I'm just thinking of my son. You know, he's going off to to university this year, and it's quite a a tough course that he's taking in, in uh, politics, philosophy and economics, but he also needs to look at all the other options around it along the way and take them with him just in case and you know you just never know really do you how that journey is going to, to grow or change and it's the same you in can business. Only be sure that, yes I think you can only be sure that it will change and that by the time he's 21, 22 and out the other side of that degree the landscape in front of him will look different than it does today. Yeah. Um, I think that opportunities are going to come earlier to people as well. I think one of the things that we're seeing in the startup community is obviously people are starting companies younger. Um, but I think that younger people are attuning themselves much more to the idea of a simultaneous portfolio. If you go back to when Charles Handy was writing about portfolios, it would be more like, okay, in the course of a working life, I might have five or six different jobs, and occasionally, but 
one or two of those might run simultaneously. But I think now young people are much better able to see life in terms of projects. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and how many simultaneous projects do I have to run to make life interesting and profitable, worthwhile? Uh, and, and certainly I think by the time your son gets to the age of 21, 22, he'll be looking at well, what projects do I develop, who do I need to work with to make one or two or three of those projects viable, um, and who do I onboard or, or, or contact as a potential mentor for one or two of these projects. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and also, what else do I need to keep uh, in the air? So, if one of these projects goes wrong, what other options do I need to already have in the air, ready to ready to run with? I think another thing with, with that whole process is that you can very easily select options which close out a whole range of opportunities for you in life, and it's much more important now than it used to be in the past. And I gave an example in the book. It's a hypothetical example, but drawn from a real one. Where, where somebody takes on a 12-month contract uh, that gives them stability and a, and a working wage for a year, but has automatically excluded themselves from, from a, a separate opportunity that comes good three months in. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the type of thing we face as well, that um, uh, we can easily preclude ourselves from opportunity by jumping too soon. But these are all quite delicate balances, and, and nobody's trained, as I was making earlier, nobody's trained to understand these choices. No, it, we're not. We're not given a book, are we? When we first start out, not literally. A little bit like you know, parenting or even starting up a business. You don't. It's not all written down because it is going to be slightly different for each person. But the basic ingredients. Uh, are really the same. They're just they're just sort of tweaked along the way. Uh, yeah, I think that most things that you will buy on business or on starting a business or on career they assume progression and they assume a linear line. And I think that the challenge for everybody now is there is no linear progression, and it's a succession of simultaneous opportunities. And, and the choices you make are really really important. And yes. excluding some options is. Uh, is a critical life decision, but it's one you're going to be making very often. Yeah, absolutely. I've just been reading through some of the um, reviews that you've received on the book, and I, I have to say they're, they're actually quite powerful, aren't they? Um, I think uh, everybody should have a have a look because uh, I'm just reading one. I like this one here. Reading Shift will not only teach you how to identify trends, but more importantly, how to adapt, respond, and profit from disruption. Well, I think that the yeah, I I, I got um, good reviews on the book. There's no question. I I think that the profit from disruption is meant to be much broader than this is going to increase your profit margins. You know, it's really about how how you can play this economy in ways which give you better fulfillment in life as well as yes, if you're in business you want to make more money. But but actually I make the point in the book that probably today you want to be much more adaptive than yes. in the past. And and that actually means that in some senses you might not make more profit but you might survive longer. Yes. And, and we've seen a number of companies now that just did not look at their longevity and their adaptive uh, capabilities, and as a result, they, they barely exist. And of course, the big, the big example of that is the phone, phone maker Nokia, which, which actually started to sink as it announced record profit growth. So, so there's a lot of irony out, uh, out there around profits, you know, and I think that, that actually one of the biggest problems we face at the moment is that a lot of companies are trying to respond to the need for growth and, and can't do it anymore. So, you know, they become they become quite difficult entities to work within or to work around. And and actually, if we were able collectively as a society to say, let's let's introduce a value shift here and talk about adaptation and survival rather than growth. Yeah, I was actually, just... that would do a lot of good. I think you're right there, Vicky. I was just that was going through my mind as you were speaking because we a lot of companies are they 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 
they're almost on a race to be the most profitable company, but they do forget about, like you say, um, adaptation and and looking at other other trends that are around there and do we need to take hold of it, do we need to adapt and things. Uh, but they're just so focused on the profit that once they're there, they're left behind actually because they've not done other things along the way. Yes, they, they haven't developed an option strategy, I think would be the best way to put it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, and it, it, it can catch you out very, very quickly and certainly yeah. bites you on the bottom if you're not careful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, you see it a lot. I mean, I know even, um, you know, a, a big high street uh, brand that a lot of people probably shop where get their food from, you know, they're, they're going through some huge turmoils at the moment, but a lot of that is probably because They've not adapted. They've just been so focused on being the market leaders, but actually, now they're not, and they're wavering and starting to lose. Yes, and, and at that point, it becomes very difficult to find the resources to invest in serious alternatives. Yeah, I think that's another side of it that you you end up in these. Um, in fact, one of the patterns of disruption that the book talks about is that when you get this kind of concentration, like you have in the UK supermarket sector or retail sector. Uh, for a while, you can generate super profits, and that makes your investors very happy. But actually, over time, those kind of super profits attract competitors in, and that's yeah. totally understandable. If you look, for example, at the banking sector, mm -hmm. uh, or even at the mobile sector, it's the very fact of industry concentration and there being so few players in it earning super profits that, that brings in a whole army of entrepreneurs who think, well, that's not right. You know, that's Morally, it's not right, and actually, I want a slice of the action. Yeah. And, and that band of entrepreneurs resents not being able to get into those markets and, and eventually finds a way. And the way it tends to do it is by cutting price in very dramatic ways that make the incumbent non-viable. So we've seen that in the UK supermarket sector, the, the fact of the kind of profitability that companies like Tesco and Sainsbury's were, were capable of generating attracted in low very low cost providers, um, yeah. but there's, there's no surprise in that, and that's you know that's a, a repetitive pattern. You can look across industry after industry. Industry concentration generates super profits that draws in um, all kinds of in innovative alternatives. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I think you know it doesn't matter what stage we're at. It, you you have to keep your eye on the ball, you have to be able to adapt because I know I've seen it where some people are so focused on on, on their one, uh, one direction and their one end goal that when change has to happen or adaption has to happen, they just fall to pieces because that isn't what they want, that's not how it was planned. Yeah. <laughs> well actually... No. <laughs> yes, every, everybody in that organisation is incentivized to carry on doing what they've been doing. So. Yeah, it's it's a really significant process to change that. Yeah, absolutely. What would be your sort of top tips to our our listeners out there? Maybe um, just to to sort of engage with with planning, um, you know, and and being adaptable. I think it's it's difficult to to render it down to a kind of a, a top five, a top ten, and those those types of things, but. And, and of course, it depends whether you're thinking of those things in a domestic setting. So, you know, you're the employee, or or you're the company owner. Let's think but of I it as if they were. Yeah, if we think of it as if we've got a, um, you know, our, our majority of listeners are going to be uh, company owners. Yeah. Well, I, I think that for a company owner, the first thing to think about, as we've mentioned a couple of times already, is optionality. So how do I actually, how do I go about creating options is, is an important first step. I think that the way to create options is to change the kind of planning metrics or investment metrics that companies use. So normally speaking, when companies do some kind of appraisal of a new option uh, or their future direction or their new product, it's to look at the total addressable market and then to say, okay, if we can get 10% of that $1 billion market, we've got $100 million in revenue and, and, and our margins will be X. You know, so very naive and simplistic and, it, and it's complicated 
a little bit by the application of the discount factors, the discounted cash flow, that type of thing. But what I found, and, and I've done a lot of research through interviews with organizations that are in the process of transformation, is that they typically move away from that kind of investment model, and they start to look for uh, secondary benefits, you know, so it's actually worth running some projects because it changes your corporate competency, or it's worth experimenting with some projects because it opens you up to different revenue streams. So changing your investment criteria is, is an important part of developing the options route for you. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't mean being less disciplined. You can, you can be very disciplined about real options analysis. So. Uh, I think those are two. And I think that the third one is to actually start to think in terms of the transformational story because companies that set out to do things differently uh, need a way to communicate that to people. And sometimes they need it in very practical terms because their investors or their key employees wonder what's going on. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to tell a story of change. It, it sounds like the most perhaps superficial side of the whole thing, but, but I think it's the most important in some ways. If you can't tell a story that's quite open-ended about change, then you won't be able to execute change. Mm. But if you look at companies that do it really well, uh, and uh, the example I like to give is Autodesk, the um, CAD CAM, originally CAD CAM design people, but they did the software for the James Cameron films. Their view of, of um, their business is that actually they don't quite know where it's going. And they call it designing the future. So their job is to design the future. In that journey, they talk about uh, discovering the fact pattern. And what they mean by the fact pattern, it's actually a legal term in American legal um, cases, when both sides, prosecution and defense, have all their data together, have all the information they need to prosecute the case or defend the case. They've established the fact pattern, and what the guys at Autodesk talk about, their job as senior executive to discover the fact pattern. So you'll see that the, the actual um, change narrative is quite open-ended. It's not saying we're, we're starting here and we're going to get there. It's not saying we are changing from to. It's actually saying, acknowledging we're in a period of uncertainty, uh, but in that period of uncertainty we have a fairly disciplined way of discovering the fact pattern. That's one way to tell, tell an open-ended change narrative. Mm -hmm. So those are the three most important things, I think. They're really good, really good points, actually. Um, and the main thing I, I would suggest to, to uh, our listeners is to, you know, have a look at your book because, um, like I say, I, I've got it, and I've, I'm a bit of a slow reader, but I'm already starting to get the gist and, and understand actually the importance of, of what it is that you speak about. So how can people um, join me and, uh, and purchase uh, your book? Well, actually, for the first three months, it's exclusively on Amazon.com and .co.uk. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think my publisher gave me a reason for that. Apparently, if you go with this three months exclusivity with Amazon, they support the sales through advertising a bit more than they would otherwise. So, so really, uh, just in Amazon.com, Amazon.co.uk, and other Amazon stores around the world, of course. Uh, at the same time, if people want me to come and talk about it, then um, my website, HaydenShaughnessy.com, has contact details, and I'll be putting more and more information up on the website as well, so it's worth keeping track of what's going on there. Fantastic, because I know you, you do um, speaking slots, so actually I think uh, it would be really interesting for people to, to engage with you and, uh, and hear you, which is, uh, which is you know, you deliver, deliver the story quite differently and, and explain the different steps that are needed. So just uh, repeat your website again. It's HaydenShaughnessy.com. Fantastic, and are you on Twitter? Yeah, at Hayden1701. Wonderful. And my first name, yeah, first name is spelled H-A-Y-D-N, like the composer Haydn. Fantastic. Well, listen, I'll let you go because I, I know you're a busy bee, um, but thank you so much for taking the time. I know that what you've just spoken about and explained will be quite uh, beneficial to, to many of our, our listeners out there. And uh, good luck with the, the book, and I hope it does really, really well for you. That's great. Thanks very much, Helen.
You're welcome. We'll speak soon. And thank you also to my listeners for joining in. You can catch up with the interview with Hayden and many of my other um, guests on www.thehelenwindershow.com. I'll speak to you all very soon. Bye for now.